good evening before we start tonight i just want to say that dan bowles and jason nephew along with mike shoes that are excused from this evening we have a few people on the moment of silence this evening thomas hutt a retired employee of the north syracuse central school district jacqueline olmstead a graduate of the north syracuse central school district and gene centenary a retired employee of the north syracuse central school district thank you we have three presentations this evening um, the first one on our list is Gillette Road Middle School's BPT presentation. So Chris. Lisa Mezzo. I'm a fifth grade ELA social studies teacher. I'm trying to share um, some good news about Gillette Road Middle School. I can have this time to speak with you. Board of Education, Super um, It's a privilege for us to be here and have a nice mid year point to share some of the things we've accomplished up to this point. Gillette Road Middle School at a glance, um, we haven't changed a whole lot. Our student body is about one thousand. I think is wonderful about our building is it's extremely stable. We have a know the Gillette Road Middle School BPT is the primary decision-making body. Our BPT right now consists of classroom and special education teachers, school librarian, school counselor, and teaching assistants, uh, along with building administration. So when we set out to make our goals for the 2017-2018 school year, uh, we looked at data closely, and that consisted of parent surveys, student surveys, and decided on these areas for the biggest need for improvement as we move forward. Our vision and mission statements. It's a great opportunity given that we have Vision 2020. Was our instruction was building a team coach, um, all 
homeowners do this? Okay, I'm going to be speaking to goals one and, or excuse me, goals two and three. Starting with goal two, this is strength and instruction with focus on inclusive education. At Gillette Road, we are all, all the staff members are working collaboratively to maintain an inclusive special ed model. Um, all staff members have or will be participating in the co-teaching institute in Austin. I have which um, had the opportunity to participate in that and have found it very beneficial to work alongside my special ed teacher in learning different strategies to use in the classroom. Uh, goal three is the cultivate partnerships with Gillette Road Middle School across the North Syracuse Central School District and with the larger community. This is where I'm just going to highlight um, a couple of things that we're doing within our school. Um, we are currently setting up a readathon that will celebrate literacy in early March. Um, this is a building-wide project that we're going to be doing. Uh, within the district, uh, some of the fifth and sixth grade teachers uh, teaching ELA will or are participating in what's called a lab classroom study or a residency where we work alongside the um, ELA helping teachers within the district to help set up and implement workshop models in the ELA classrooms effectively. Um, and within the community, a lot of our clubs, our student clubs, are helping support different organizations such as Meals on Wheels, Rescue Mission, Salvation Army, and Hurricane Relief. We have a lot of different things that we are doing within our school, our district, and within our community. And our fourth goal of engaging staff and community improving culture and climate really comes out of our commitment as a faculty to create a healthy and safe learning environment. Um, one of the areas that we are trying to be very proactive is in um, creating a positive environment where students feel safe. Um, and teaching them how to deal with bullying, but being proactive and trying to prevent it, not just being reactive. So a couple of uh, assemblies that we have that are coming up uh, in January, actually this Friday um, on the half day, there will be an assembly for all students on cyberbullying, internet safety, and digital citizenship. And in March, we will have another assembly on the half day in March where we're really <coughs> focusing on choices. So presenting an assembly to the students about how, how the choices they make can impact other people as well as themselves and the consequences or benefits to certain choices. That'll be in March. Um, and this really comes from, again, the need for our commitment to be proactive um, in trying to deter negative behaviors and create that positive culture and environment.
really high functioning. Went through this very quickly, and we understand details of description slide by slide of a lot of. Anyone have any questions? First of all, great job, great presentation. Um, I was just wondering, um, how are your BPT members selected? I mean, is it the same core group of people every year, or is there? Based on what we believe, um, and I was just wondering, um, how are the students adjusting to the inclusive classrooms? Yeah, I do. Um, you know, currently, I think at this point in time, the kids are getting more used to it um, because it's been in place for a couple of years now. And I think it's just a natural, a natural system. Very comfortable. I think teachers are starting to become more comfortable as well. We have a lot of support around the district that's very helpful. Like I said, with the re residency that I'm actually currently doing that right now. Um, and Kelly Flaherty, that's very helpful for those ELA t helping teachers come what the workshop model should look like and then they kind of sit back and they do like a gradual release where we take part in some of the lesson and then they give us feedback and then by the end of it we take over the whole lesson they're there to observe us and give us feedback on that so I think it's really been an adjustment for everyone um, but I think everyone's really doing really well with it great um, and then uh, also the assembly for bullying I think <coughs> that this age especially I just know from my own experience when I was in middle school and having two boys that have gone through school this age you definitely um, teach them the right behaviors model the right behaviors um, there are there things that are being shared with this is something that has to be continuously done as well. Outstanding. Thank you guys. Appreciate Thank you guys. it.
right, next up we have Roxborough. So, Dave. Good evening, everyone. Michelle Gardner, I'm um, seventh grade special education teacher and PTC chair. Roxboro has three areas of focus that we've been working on this year. First, wraps around data systems. The first area of focus um, has been creating sustainable data systems, and that really started last year. Um, we were one of the finalists for an RTI grant at the New York State RTI Center um, at Buffalo, University of Buffalo, um, and the group of us went to the conference, and it really laid the foundational work for what is RTI response to intervention, um, what are the core integral pieces that we need for that. Um, and as well as moving forward, looking at multi-tier systems of support, which also um, not only just includes the educational piece, but also behavioral tiers of, tiers of support as well. Team's also been working on rules and tools for using it. here is an example of um, the data wall and this is actually seven students that have been pulled out um, and their actual scores um, so we have the student name and then the RI is our screener for reading it's our reading screener so we have it for fall and then winter and then we'll have a spring score um, is the ma MI is the math so the math fall math winter and math spring score um, the colors are the numbers are color-coded um, if you look at under the RI score, all of those um, in the RI for fall are proficient. They're in green. As you can see, we had um, the super bright green is um, above grade level. So we know we can track those kids and see um, the progress that they've made. What's really, really interesting um, and exciting about the data wall is you can then shift over and these are the same students' MI scores or their math scores. So we have kids who are proficient in reading, who are also making gains in reading. The majority of them, some of them went down. You can look over and see that we have some kids in the red. So that is, um, those are our kids that we really want to hit with some really hard targeted interventions. They need a lot of support there. Some of them have increased with just their regular tier one or their classroom instruction. They've made progress. Um, some have made some a gradual progress. So this starts this conversation of, we have some pretty typical seventh grade readers here look at their math scores, what, what's going on there. So you can have some really targeted discussions about instructions and specifically what does each individual student need. 
Um, another nice thing about all of our data wilds, fifth, sixth, and seventh are all electronic. Um, so they're easy to share with all, with all classroom teachers, special area teachers, it, which is, is huge. If you're a PE teacher and you're giving a PE test that's, that's written, and you're wondering, wow, they, they seem to know the content, but they're really struggling with the test, you can look on here and say, oh, fine, maybe they're struggling with, with some reading. It's the reading, not actual access to the PE curriculum. So it's really important data that we're using to base um, our instruction off of for RTI and classroom instruction, getting all those tools. happy with that. Similar to last year, five percent growth would be a year's a different test. This year, but our kids came in very six fifteen on their math. This year they came in at our five. However, our growth is is a half year point. We're right on track. Seven seventy and the six thirty. The, the difference in those numbers. Looking at growth percentage rates, yeah. there's a, we're, we're growing at the same rate. Yeah. Uh, the test itself changed and so that much lower. So the growth is test, it looks like got a little. Grade level, we broke it down. Expect the fifth graders to grow more. Last year, they grew at 38 percent halfway point. They grew at 50. Yeah, yeah, the absolute value changed on us this year. Dave, are you able to identify what changed and what the, they're struggling with? Um, from what I've heard from the math AIS team, the old test itself shifted. And so it's not a matter of whether they're struggling. It took about itself harder. What sure is that the students on our data wall, these are slides that were red to the yellow. All of the numbers have shifted along with it, but a red also last year is not what I read. All of it shifted kind of down uh, at the halfway point of the year from where they started. Our second area of focus has been on building culture. Trade in particular has With an invitation on the board. Locker night and open house. And uh, 
operating agreement. And Mary, when you mentioned, you know, teaching in school at the fifth grade has our guidelines and expectations, it means um, so the fifth grade has been doing weekly lessons centered on these agreements and what it looks like. Examples of explicitly teach. Foxborough Campus Committee, which is yet to be named, looking at uh, big lots, whether it's through parking. Measured in Lapland or That's our target, but I'm still very happy. It was not going well for years. Sustainability was that third area of focus um, for us this year, and uh, we kind of looked at the role of our BPT, and we decided we really were wanting to focus on data and systems, so we created an action plan process for new events, old events, new things that we would like to try within the building. Uh, we created an action plan for that, which is just a nice way of creating actionable steps, who's responsible for it, um, and with some data, how do you know it's working, how do you not know it's working? We need to do um, to move forward. Um, we also, the, we have the BPT and the data team work very close together. Um, as the data team gets going and we start noticing trends in the data, the, B, the data team, um, BPT will look at that data and look at school-wide trends and then can make recommendations for uh, professional development, so on and so forth, to, um, to, to support the data. Um, we also have so many great um, activities at Rocks. Um, the Rocks Trap, March Kindness, Pie Night, that's Parent Education. There's so many different things that we have um, who kind of, we had different um, teachers step up and say, oh, I'll lead this or I'll lead that. The concern is what happens if that teacher is no longer there. So the BPT is overseeing, um, kind of overseeing those to make sure that there is sustainability and these great activities will have longevity. Aligned with the Vision 20 conversations within our building, and we're in the process of taking it further to all of our social studies teachers about the Vision 2020. Had conversations with their students about I over here. Survey questions, and so we can what they have to say about why they come to school, what their needs are from us, that information. Really taking our time with it. 
um, which I meant we're evolving in all of this work and we're really together in all of this work as we learn together so that we can use Yeah, and on the the RTI and the wind time, and in the way you ended with the master schedule, can you give me an idea? What what does it look like now? You mentioned sixth grade was studying it and implementing your seventh grade. <clears throat> and then I look at this comment about the master schedule, so I just wondered where you where do you have this time in sixth and, and in seventh? I assume when you say when you're breaking them into different small taking those. Is it by grade level? Only grade level people are you bringing in like like school? All hands on deck. Anyone who's available? Oh. Teacher, went to Mike Maddow's, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> I, I've heard a lot about him. Oh, he, that's his quote. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Record him by accident. But, um, <laughs> absolutely. No, the intent is to try to reduce that. some tier two services at wind time. Discussion about whether AIS tier three, is that a tier two? Whether it raises the level. Discussion about scheduling more direct. Fifth and sixth grades in the elementary schedule. But as long as we can allow study halls and group very hard this summer and redoing our schedule to make sure that as a team of six and a team of seven. I assume you're going to be pulling some of the same. Well, good luck, though. I mean, that's great. Um, going to be creative. Also, when part of what we're studying, I was just able to go to an RTI institute from it this week. Part of it is the study of psychology. Junction in seventh and eighth. Working in a bomb with my school's learning. RTI in the summer. Um, the same thing that this Scheduling is a big piece of it. Um, and how we look at around all the areas to look in the part of the process. When we started with the sixth grade, that was a piece of um, First of all, I just want to say great job on your presentation. And I especially like to hear um, what you're doing to teach the kids about why they go to school, um, painting the big them and not just because I said so. 
Um, it's so important. Um, well, that's what our parents told us. So thank you so much. I just had a question about um, the, the lap. Um, like, what's next? Like, what is this more a question for Donna Marie or what happens? You just next test scores or? I'd just like to make a comment, and I think, you know, when you talk about the LAP plan, and yes, all of that is based on state testing, and I think the fact that you're looking at your own internal data is actually much more meaningful than the state testing because of the opt-out and other reasons as well. But I'm almost wondering if the LAP plan that you were forced to do didn't face, didn't force your building to come together and, and really put some meaningful plans together in terms of how to move forward. Your presentation tonight was leaps and bounds above what it was two years ago. You, you, your building really needs to pat themselves on the back, your, all, all of your staff, in terms of what you've been able to accomplish in two years. And your presentation sh and your data showed it tonight. So, yes. important for the kids. Thanks guys. Thank you. All right. Uh, next we have uh, Don to update us on our favorite topic, the budget for this year. Good evening. As you uh, all are probably aware, the governor uh, last Tuesday gave his budget presentation, his budget proposal, and um, that's the first item on our agenda. We're going to talk about his proposal, and then we have uh, been able to collect enough information to uh, calculate our preliminary tax cap, and we'll share that as well. And, and as is customary this time of year, we start to look toward the end of the year and ask ourselves where will our fund balance and reserves be at the end of the year. Um, so without further ado, the, the governor's budget proposal um, provides about a 3% increase to uh, school aid across the state. Um, about half of it is an increase in the funding of foundation aid. Um, uh, unfortunately, um, it's significantly less than the deficit or the amount of foundation aid that the state is not paying today and I'll get more into that in a moment. Um, one of the, once again the major focus of the governor's uh, budget proposal is to increase funding for high needs school districts and to, to be clear technically what that means is those districts with a 50 percent or higher free and reduced meal rate and our free and reduced rate is approximately 36 and a half percent. Um, so we are not considered a high needs district, um, although there are times when and, and areas where we, we do feel like our needs are, are um, greater than, um, uh, than the funding that's being provided to us. Specifically for North Syracuse, our foundation aid is going to go up about $761,000. That's the, the big increase in our, in our budget. Um, the, uh, if you look at total with aid without building, um, aid, we're going to have an increase of about $822,000 or about 1.34%. Um, that's, you know, that's a modest increase when you think about the fact that we have contractual salary increases uh, that we'll be providing our employees that uh, are about 3% of, of wages. Um, our, our teacher's retirement alone is going up uh, from about 9.8% to about 11% of payroll. That's about a $700,000 increase. So. This is, uh, if I move to my summary slide here, um, this uh, governor's proposal is, is very disappointing uh, given the fact there were $8 million underfunded this year in our foundation aid to only get a $761,000 uh, increase is really disappointing. 
Um, I haven't talked uh, on the previous slide. You saw that we had a, a, a building aid uh, reduction, and, and I, I want to be uh, let the, the board know that um, our building aid reduction relates mostly to just paying off old debt. Uh, as you know, we have many capital projects that we've worked on over the years, and uh, that reduction just relates to the fact that some older um, debt is being paid off, and uh, commensurate with that, uh, our, uh, our we'll have less debt service payments we have to make, and we'll get less building aid. So, our focus at this time um, is really on that um, funding without uh, building aid, or the aid, the the state aid without the building aid considered, and that's really the the aid that funds our educational programs. Um, we are working with our legislators to uh, to finalize our building aid for 17 and, and 17, 18, and 18, 19 because we do have some administrative issues that we're trying to resolve. Um, but overall, we are are disappointed with the aid increase, um, and we'll uh, again work with our um, legislators, and we'll have a better sense of uh, where we stand on February 20th, 26th, when we come back and present our initial budget to the board. This slide, if it looks familiar, it's the same slide I've showed at every uh, presentation when we talk about foundation aid. Um, this really is the Achilles heel of our aid situation. Foundi foundation aid is the most significant aid uh, that we receive. Um, we're grossly underfunded. Uh, as you can see, the last number on the slide is this year's funding at eight, almost $8.3 million, lower than we're supposed to be getting. Um, and, uh, and it looks like with the $761,000 increase that we're getting will still be in the ballpark of $8 million underfunded. Um, and that needs to be a, uh, our focus in terms of uh, working with our legislature to get them to uh, fully fund foundation aid. The good news is last year's proposal that the governor had, he was proposing changing formulas and moving away from foundation aid, and um, uh, none of that has been mentioned this year. So uh, the, the buzz is that we'll eventually get fully funded. It just may take many years. So we'll have to, we'll have to see how that all works out. The tax cap. Um, so the numbers that we've been waiting for, uh, primarily, as everybody knows, uh, it's the 2 percent tax cap. Uh, uh, our, inf our increase is either 2 percent or inflation, whichever is less. Well, that's the center number. They're called the allowable levy growth factor. And um, inflation was just uh, was higher than 2 percent, just slightly. And so our allowable levy growth factor is going to be 2 percent, and that's why uh, we're using a factor of 1.02. That represents 2 percent. The other uh, factor that's uh, worth talking about is, is that tax base growth factor. And, and all of us are aware, we, we see all the development going on in our, in our district, housing and, 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 uh, and whatnot in the northern part of our district. And uh, what the state does is they publish tax base growth factors. And they, they, they acknowledge that if your tax base is growing, um, and that if you're, uh, there's the potential for additional demands on the district, uh, that they allow you to grow your levy based on that. And so our tax base growth factor is 1.01. Um, so those are the two big drivers. Um, as you can see, um, if you notice the tax levy for capital for 1718, that was 2.6, almost $2.7 million in 1718. And that's dropping down to $2.1 million. That's the local share of um, our uh, capital projects. And so uh, that's dropping. And therefore, as I mentioned in earlier slides, the aid is dropping. Um, we're also seeing a decline in our uh, pilots. The number of uh, payment in lieu of tax agreements that are, are outstanding uh, is down to about $219,000. Um, so our tax levy, levy limit uh, increase is about $2.3 million, or 2.72%. And that represents about $65 before star on a $100,000 home. So fun, fund balance, projected fund balance. Well, at the end of last year, uh, our audit reported that we had about $6.3 million in unassigned fund balance. That's our savings. Um, what we look at is where our revenues and expenditures are going to be uh, for this year, the 17-18 school year, and, and honestly, it's too early to tell uh, where we're going to land. Um, and so I, I, need to, I need to just put a TBD there until we have more information. Um, 
But I want to remind the board we appropriated uh, $2.7 million last year to support the budget. So the only way you can get rid of that appropriation is to have an additional $2.7 million of revenue. And since the governor's budget proposal only gives us a little over 800000 it seems logical to me that if we're going to maintain spending at our current levels, we'll need to appropriate another 2.7 going into the 18-19 school year. Um, so I'm projecting that our unassigned fund balance will probably be about $3.6 million as of June of 18, which represents about 2.29 percent of our 17-18 uh, budget. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, well, one of the things we're working on is putting our spending plan together, and we're going to come to you, to, come to you with that on the, um, on the 27th uh, of, of February. Um, if you take the total of the, uh, the tax levy increase and the state aid, you've got a little over $3 million of increased revenue. Um, I'm guessing that our expenses will be um, uh, increased by about that amount. Uh, so the only way you, you could um, get rid of this 2.7 is to have our revenues increase by 2.7 million more than our expenses. Uh, so we'll have to, we're still working on it, but um, I, I think it's a safe bet that we're going to need a decent appropriation uh, going into the 18-19 school year. In terms of reserves, I'm, I'm, kind of, I'm happy to report that we've worked hard to um, take a good hard look at each of these reserves and make sure that the district is appropriately reserved for any potential liabilities in these areas. And I still feel confident that uh, we're in good shape. The only change from June of 17 to June of 18 is going to be small amount of interest income uh, that the district will earn on these funds. So no change in, in reserves. So as I, as I mentioned, our next big milestone is to look at the initial budget. And so if I can, just to take a minute to give you picture there's a lot of activity going on behind the scenes. Our principals and directors are working on their building level and department level budgets. Uh, we are uh, working with our HR department to incorporate into all of our payroll the um, uh, salary increases that have been negotiated in the contracts um, and we're pretty much complete with that process. We've, uh, we've solicited um, information on our health benefits and on our pension costs and uh, we're pulling together um, costs on um, energy and fuel and, um, and, a, and, a, and a variety of things like that, the bigger items in our budget, so that when we come to you on the 26th, we'll be um, in a position to talk, uh, uh, you know, specifically about our expenditures. Uh, we're going to meet in early February with uh, principals to talk about their staffing levels and enrollment and class sizes and whatnot, and all of that will be baked into that uh, budget on the 26th. Uh, we'll have a lot of work to do between the 26th of, of February and April 2nd when uh, we'll ask the board to adopt the budget. Uh, so it'll be a busy, a busy month ahead. Um, any questions or comments? Um, I just have a comment. I'm just a little worried about the fund balance going to, spent, but we've had it lower, correct? Yeah, and for when I, when I, when I got here, we were under two percent. Um, I too am worried about that, uh, but I think we. It's early. We need to see how this year ends up. Uh, we'll see where those TBDs, <laughs> where our revenues and expenses actually end up, because uh, they will affect our fund balance. But um, uh, yes, 2.29 is, is, is a low fund balance when the state recommends that you have 4%. What's the negative impact of that? Um, does it affect our powering power? Or That's a great question. Uh, um, I, we have been through um, reviews uh, by the rating agencies, and I, th I feel reasonably confident that we'll be able to maintain um, our credit rating um, at, at this level. Uh, but, not, uh, but I don't think we will if we get much lower. So that, that's something we need to keep an eye on. And that affects the cost of our borrowing, our interest rate. The better our bond rating, the, better, the lower our interest rate is. Any other questions or comments? Thank you. <clears throat> Moving on to uh, comments from the audience, we have uh, one tonight. Uh, Randy and Don Matthews speak on policy 5140. Just want to remind you of the three minutes. 
I would like to address the uh, possible changes brought on by policy 5140 school admissions that you are considering. If this policy is approved, it will affect many children across the district in many ways. The adverse effects will devastate children's social emotional growth and development. Let me share how this decision will affect our children as just one case and will be the result of approving this policy. My children, Ethan and Gianna, attend schools outside of our elementary and middle school zones. This happens because they have attended the same babysitter since both were born and uh, were three months old. Ethan now attends Roxborough Road Middle School where he would be allowed to continue through seventh grade and head on to junior high where he is excelling and having a wonderful time. Gianna currently attends Allen Road Elementary School, but we forced to attend Gillette to find a new baby, uh, but we forced to attend Gillette and find a new babysitter all while Ethan continues to attend Roxborough and the same babysitter. Gianna will be removed from her brother, her babysitter, her friends, and her community. Um, her activities are North Syracuse based because as a community she calls home. Her Little League is North Syracuse. She'll be required to leave her friends and teams because she's no longer attending a school in their zone and will have to move to a completely new Little League. Her soccer team is North Syracuse based. Her friends are in North Syracuse and we have to spend our time driving her around to North Syracuse to have play dates and attend birthday parties. She has been with this cohort of children since preschool. Her best friends are her school friends from Allen Road and the kids from her teams in North Syracuse. She will no longer be allowed to attend her babysitter whom she has known as a second mother since her birth. While her brother gets to stay there, that means dropping the children off at two different sitters every morning and forcing our children to be separated and forcing us to spend extra now to pay for two different babysitters. This will be very difficult to explain to my daughter why her brother can continue his life unaffected with his babysitter who is like family while she will be uprooted and required to start a new life without her second mother and without her brother. They always talk about going to school together again at the middle school level since he left Allen Road. They will not have that opportunity if this happens. Fifth grade is a huge transition for students and I have listed a multitude of negative impacts that will be inflicted upon my daughter. And my other question is how will this decision affect her academics? We have not middle school shopped or attempted to take advantage of the system. We have in fact helped the district by sending our children to underpopulated schools as opposed to the much higher populated Lakeshore and Gillette. We chose our babysitter before our son was born. This is a very difficult thing to do as we are trusting someone else with our baby's care. She was not chosen because of the school that she was zoned for. Our belief has always been that the North Syracuse School Board does, uh, North Syracuse School Board does what is right by the children and the community. This policy has many unintended consequences. We ask that you consider special circumstances that are in the best interest of the child or to phase in the policy with the incoming kindergartners. We also ask that you table the vote, explore both the amount of children who will be affected within communities, their comfort zones, their friends. Also, to allow for community input on a decision that will directly impact children. Please consider the social emotional growth impact and how your votes will affect the students during the biggest developmental transition in middle school. We ask that you consider how this will affect the children within the North Syracuse community. Um, moving on to board committee reports. Um, the policy committee met on January 16th. Day. Um, I just want to commend the committee did a fantastic job. We had a huge agenda because we hadn't met in a while and we got through 18 policies and they're on to mixture of just readoption. I wasn't at the last meeting here, but we did have a legislative committee meeting January 3rd, I think, or 2nd, right away in the beginning of January. And we had a robust discussion with uh, Regent Elizabeth Hackinson with regards to the Regent's role in recommending school funding. And the committee will meet again, or is scheduled to meet again on February 2nd. On policies meeting again on February 12th. Up 
before I pass it off, I just want to say I had a chance to go to the <clears throat> junior high school play of Damn Yankees last Friday. Um, it was a week late because of the weather, um, but I just want to commend all the students and the staff. Good show. Annette? So I have a couple of good news things. Um, if you've read any of the news reports, people would know that 35 Central New York students have advanced to the oral round of the spelling bee. And I would like to acknowledge some students from the school district. From Gillette Road Middle School, Joseph DeGrout moves on, advancing to the next round. And then we have several students who attend North Syracuse Junior High School. Delia Fidelli, Charles French Jr., Jacob Garofalo, and Gabriel Moravi. So congratulations to them, and we wish them well as they move on. So as you can imagine, sometimes I get uh, emails from people that aren't happy. A couple of emails that I got recently that really made me smile. So this morning was one of them. I had an email from a gentleman named Kevin Cook, and he wanted me to know that on fr last Friday, that he had the pleasure of hosting the first art exhibit at the Barnes Hiscock Mansion on James Street in Syracuse with artwork that was supplied by North Syracuse Central School District students. They came up with the idea and reached out to every school district in Onondaga County and the only one that responded was our art teacher, Kara Cook. No relation to this gentleman, Mr. Cook, he points out. Um, but due to Kara Cook and um, our students. He said the response was overwhelming and far better than they had hoped. Great comments about the students' artwork. And this was a fundraiser for their organization. And because of Kara and our students, they raised $800 through donation. So um, people that were there are hoping that this will become an annual event. So I just wanted to point out that once again, we're working in partnerships with the community in ways that we had never thought of before. So thanks to Kara for doing that. And then I often comment on our sports teams. Um, and I do try to attend a lot of the events. And some of us were at a real nail biter with a boys basketball team Friday night. Um, but I received an email that was unusual a couple of weeks ago. Our hockey team who's doing quite well, but I don't think they had had a good, good game this particular night. They played at a rink that they normally don't play at. And Mr. Benarski and I received an email from the director of that rink commenting on the fact that our, our hockey team left that locker room immaculate. It was so clean that he took the time to send us uh, an email and say that we have really good students with great character and um, it was noticeable and he wanted us to know that so those are the things that are really important okay thank you uh, moving on to routine action items um, do I have a motion to take a B C D and E as all in favor Discussion action items. A, to a resolution authorizing into up to a 48-month service contract with BOCES for communication devices. Procedure right down. Um, do I have a motion for that? Aaron, Mike, paper. We do have a gift this evening. Uh, the CNS football. Oh, the date change. Thank you. Um, B, the date change of the March 19th board meeting. We are moving this from March 19th to March 26th. Paul and Mary. Okay, the gift. Uh, we do have a gift. The CNS Football Booster Club has donated to the district 75 football helmets valued at $17,700. Thank them very much for that gift. Do I have a motion to accept with gratitude the gift? George, Patrick, all in favor? Uh, I will make a motion to accept uh, policies listed in D, E, F, G, H, I, J, and K 
as a group, as Mary mentioned, the majority of these are readoptions with a few that are amend and readopt. Uh, take these policies as a group. Make the motion, but I want to. Second, Aaron, all in favor. I would like to take note of a couple of retirements this evening. We have Roger Cronk, a custodial worker at CNS, is retiring with 27 years of service. Reba Schultz is a custodial worker at Gillette Road Middle School who is retiring with 34 years of service. And Tom Van Beveren, a custodial worker, retires with 16 years of service. So we thank them for all of their time and wish them well in their retirement. For personnel items, do we need an uh, executive session before we take items A and B? Do I have a motion to accept personnel A and B as a group? Mike Leone, Mary, all in favor? All right, I would like to make a motion to move into executive session for the purpose of reviewing an update on one legal matter relative to potential litigation and to review the employment history of four individuals with no action to follow. Do I have a second? Aaron, all in favor? We're adjourned. If there are any students here that need our signature, we welcome you to come up. <laughs>